Good morning. It is 10 o'clock and we are starting the CareCast. I am your host, Victor Montori, and on behalf of the Knowledge and Evaluation Research Unit, we would like to welcome you to these uh, CareCasts. Uh, the purpose of the CareCast is to discuss with distinguished guests uh, about the, uh, uh, their careers, their lives, their principles, and how these connect with um, the uh, goal that we have of helping care fit in the lives of patients. Our first guest is Roberto Benzo. Uh, Dr. Benzo is a physician at the Mayo Clinic a distinguished uh, uh, investigator and researcher into uh, how might we improve the lives of patients with breathlessness. He's federally funded, manages a, a large uh, research team, and has been successful in developing uh, a, and implementing a series of interventions uh, using mindfulness and coaching that allow patients with breathlessness to live better lives. Roberto, welcome to the CareCast. Thank you so much for having me here. Excellent. So to start our conversation, um, one of the things that we, uh, we would like to uh, understand is how is it that people become who they are? How is it that they arrive at a, at a situation in their life where they are Roberto Benzo? Um, tell us a little bit about what has motivated your, your journey. Well, I think it's... Um a lot of um, passion, I think, uh, trying to have a, some kind of a sense where you're going, and, uh, but also being humble enough that you don't control all the variables. What do you and, mean you uh, don't control the variables? <laughs> what is that? There's a lot of serendipity in life, and, uh, and then I think that we need to honor that, that things happen and then we need to prepare for them. And then we start kind of pressing buttons that are in front of us. We don't press any button that is just too far. You, want, you press the one that is at the reach of your hand. And, that, and for that, you have to be very, very attentive. And, uh, and that, I think that, you know, it's like, a, you know, Steve Jobs kind of addressed the Stanford uh, uh, commencement one time and said, you really connect the dot backwards. I mean, really, I mean, the thing is that you don't really know right now to kind of say forward what is going to happen. But you actually, when you look it back, you say, oh, that happened. And I was able to press that button and then it, went, it took me to another place. I never thought I would be doing what I'm doing right now. I mean, I kind of have a sense of caring for patients. And, uh, but, you know, but there was some crisis that you go for when I realized that I don't fix everybody. I don't fix at all. So, and, uh, so, 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 the, so, the, so what you're telling me is when somebody asks you, uh, oh, what are you going to do when you grow up? You, 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 you couldn't answer what you're, what you're doing right now. The, you know, you, uh, we talked before about, you know, how you plan for the future. I think that you plan for the future standing very well where you are right now. I think that you actually, what now? So the thing is that what is it that you're really passionate about that you're really willing to put 100% behind and then move forward? And that may not be what society or your father or your mentor wants. Or, or, re or research funders, right? Because the research funders would like you to set up a career plan, a career goal, and it's always set up in, in five-year time periods. And I think as the cruel joke goes, Nobody sitting in 2020 would have answered in 2015, what do you plan to do in five years? You know, we wouldn't be in the midst of COVID. So, um, so it, it's, it's a very it's a strange expectation, isn't it? That, that we can plan ahead with such a, a long uh, runway. It's, uh, it's, it's also a lot of courage. I think that, you know, a, I, um, I, um, I think that when you are really working on creativity, there are a couple of things that you need to know. I mean, you need, uh, they're important for me. Being curious and overcoming the fear of changing. So, uh, so the thing is that uh, I mean, I uh, when I had my initial funding, the K, and then of course I was learning. I had to kind of uh, drink every drop of my mentor's comments. And that, but the, the issue is, at some point, I realized that I didn't belong. That I was kind of going to another direction. I used to be in an institution that honor kind of molecules and genes, and I was doing self management talking about people quality of life and what is important for you today. 
So, so it kind of a, a, I was out of favor of that environment, and I said, I said to myself, I need to go somewhere else. And then when, and then you know, Mayo Clinic came to my my journey. I know. So, so what I can tell you is serendipity exists. Uh, life is bubbling in the present moment. Things are mm -hmm. actually bubbling in front of you if you are attentive to push that button. And that's my. So it, sound, it sounds like paying attention, being present being uh, acceptance of chance and uh, being able to act on chance uh, have been important uh, to, to get you where you are. And, and, that, and having the passion. So knowing exactly what- I can't can tell do. that you have any passion. I, I don't know. I mean, you seem to hide it well. Yeah. I, well, it's like, uh, you know, what actually moves you? It's like, I think it's a question that we need to ask permanently. And that change in life, change like, uh, it's very promiscuous, you know, because what moves you now it doesn't really, I mean, and maybe it doesn't move you again, but it's kind of, life is kind of a bubbling in the present moment. It's the, it's the eternal now, you know? And uh, so uh, that is, I think, an important thing to go to the, you know. So if side. I were to ask you, uh, what has been the primary value that has moved you through your research career or through your personal life? What, what would the primary value be? I think I wanted to make people comfortable, content with their life. With, I think that was something that stayed with me since I became a resident. Uh, you know, I, it's like, I think that goes beyond knowledge. Is, uh, that has stayed with me. And, uh, and then also kind of uh, at the same time, kind of creating condition for contentment and, uh, and then, uh, also have that authenticity uh, when you're talking to people, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, I mean, the one thing I, you know, I, I mentioned in our, in our, when we chat before together, is like the number one patient that you need to change or work on is the one that you see in the mirror. And uh, so I started to kind of uh, make sure that, uh, you know, I, um, I can produce that contentment and uh, degree of authenticity with my own self. But the thing is that, you know, I would say that that was a stay with me in my career as, uh, you know, and then founded, is the foundation of what then became my research and my work. It sounds like authenticity was, uh, uh, was the, one of the triggers that moved you from realizing that the molecular was not yours, you know, that the environment uh, that honors that was not yours and that you had to, in, in, in the care unit, in our research unit, we have three, um, three values that we, we think orient our work and bring us together, patient-centeredness, integrity, and generosity. Do any of those ring particularly close to your heart? Uh, generosity, uh, I think is what I think is, uh, is what actually gave me the, the, the biggest, uh, um, if you will, um, satisfaction. Uh, is, you know, what's going out, you know, what's coming in. So it's like uh, this, uh, you you know, it's like a, I, I prove myself again and again that uh, uh, sometimes I think I don't, I'm not giving anything and people are so appreciative. And I ask myself, oh, what? I'm just, uh, we're just chatting. We're just kind of discussing. We're just kind of, uh, but it's like, uh, I think that the ending, uh, generosity means uh, a lot of attention you know, a lot of attention to, it. I'm just saying, when we are in, in, a, in an encounter uh, with, with a friend, with a patient, with a, it's, it's about how much are you there? Uh, one of my teachers says, if you're thinking too much, you're not there. Uh, so the, the, the point is that how much are you really there? And people actually have this sincerity meter inside that knows that you are actually completely there. And uh, so, uh, you know, so that generosity start with our attention, I think. Uh, so, so going to your to this work that you do with mindfulness to help people with breathlessness, what what role does generosity play in that? Well, the the main thing is that I would say, listen. So, when in every co coaching call and every health coaching call, the biggest mindfulness part is to listen, to just shut shut up, and to just con drop everything, drop the idea that you want to change people. Kind of what's going on with you, Victor? So, so tell me about it. I'm becoming genuinely curious about it. I think that I am convinced I became a better doctor since I listened more. Or it's not that I got it, you know, let's just get that very clear. 
I, I, it's like uh, it's the intent. It's the it's the always climbing, trying to kind of get to this uh, idea of uh, total attention. Or and and I would say refocus. Kind of a your 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 mind was somewhere else. You just bring it back here. Kind of a and and I think that it, it make me more. Uh, more attentive to not only to the conversation, but more attentive to the love values, to attentive mm -hmm. to the to the CT scan, to more attentive to interpreting the you know the data, kind of putting together the data into actually the patient the patient condition. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that to me has been one of the, my assets or the thing that had me been trying to be a better doctor. So, so Roberto, you are a a a, a, a breathless uh, breathless. Uh, uh, ex breathlessness expert, um, and uh, one of the things that characterizes 2020 is breathlessness, right? Um, we have gone from COVID uh, uh, taking away people's ability to breathe to the George Floyd um, uh, uh, murder, uh, which, uh, which has George Floyd's final words be, I can't breathe. Breathlessness has been a description of uh, of this year, and you it finds you as one of the world's preeminent breathlessness expert, and using a mind uh, approach to, uh, towards mindfulness that uh, helps patients. You want to tell us a little bit about how is it that this approach helps patients with breathlessness? And, and perhaps, you know, uh, we can listen to this with two ears. You know, one is as a clinical tool, which is how you, I think you've developed it, uh, but also to think of it as a strategy to deal with the breathlessness of 2020. Yeah, so I think that the, the uh, uh, one thing to realize is that breathlessness is very promiscuous too. So the thing is that there's a lot of stuff that makes you short of breath. And even if your lungs are fine, Many people say I cannot breathe and, and the lungs are completely fine. So there are many factors that goes into, into the feeling short of breath. And it's good to actually pay attention to those. Is that something that is coming from kind of the pneumonia due to COVID? Or is it because somebody is actually grabbing your, your neck? Or is somebody because you're just sad or anxious? Or, uh, so there are many things that actually go into that. So I think that, uh, I think that what, what we're trying to do is that we try to Kind of a tease out those different things. So of course we actually, I'm a doctor. I want to see the lung function. I want to see the X-ray. I want to see all those things. But also I realized over the years that uh, there are many other things that bring you to the sense of I cannot breathe. And uh, and so the thing is that we try to kind of, if you will, synergize the power of knowledge, but also with the powers of listening and uh, the power to kind of find out what are the things that we can fix. I, I deal with patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, smoking related lung disease, and then we cannot regenerate those lungs. But I can tell you that shown of the breath improve with interventions that not necessarily improve the lung function. And, and that is actually will keep us going because the thing is that what is it that we actually can get better? What are the factors that we can improve? So we work on obesity and obesity is a Pandora box because I mean that, that, that means, you know, the, the, mean the awareness, what you eat, how much you move. I mean, the thing is that, the, 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 you know, the, the, how you see your body and then you I mean all the way to physical activity, all the way of, uh, to meaning in life, all the way to relationships. I mean, relationships, one of the things that make, take our breath away so many times in a good way and in a bad way. So the thing is that, so, so the thing is that is the, if you will, it's a multi-component uh, uh, approach to breathlessness. And remember, when people come to Mayo Clinic, they already receive every bronchodilator under the sun. Be, and you know, the thing is that we're looking outside the box. We're looking at trying to kind of, uh, uh, you know, see in the big picture, the helicopter view of the breathlessness of the patient. And, and for that, you need to kind of. Uh, you you still you still got me at uh, uh, the breathlessness of relationships. I'm still stuck there for a second. There. Um, uh, thank you for that. Um, the um, tell me so what is how does it work? So if I'm a patient with uh, with uh, difficulty breathing and uh, and I'm in your program, what what is my experience? Well, the, the th uh, number one, you actually again. When we get to these patients, they already have the, if you will, the basic assessment on the physiology. So that we, we kind of characterize a patient that is in the, from the, if you will, has the standards of care 
that you need, and then we start to tease out these other parts. And uh, so we, uh, my my current work is on remote monitoring and uh, and then um, home-based programs in which people wear a, a, like a Garmin and they actually need to go into a tablet and they put their, their you know how much short I mean overall how how are you today well-being. Uh, the level of fatigue, the level of shortness of breath, and the step and the the progression to the step goal that they actually agree with their coach. And uh, so the thing is, uh, the um, so we we talk about those things, and then uh, and, and then we discuss about you know some physiologic factors because people actually do some yoga at home and move, and then we check their oxygen, and then we see if there is any desaturation of oxygen. But the point is that we try to kind of go over. The amount of steps at what time you actually move tell me more about that people actually to become more confident and self efficacious of actually of what they are doing also we set a step goal and then the step goal i mean it can be also graded every day and if you uh, we use uh, techniques of behavioral economics because if you actually achieve the step goal, step goal 25 cents per day go to unicef for a child hunger and if you actually go for beyond uh, a thousand steps from your step goal, 50 cents per day go to UNICEF for a child hunger. So they actually, they are seeing that they are, things are bigger than themselves, you know? Not only that they owe the step goal to actually feel better um, because physical activity improves everything under the sun. Picture yourself that kid that actually receives that 50 cents from, from you. From, from you from so, so, you, you, so it's interesting that the, the intervention itself introduces generosity uh, into, the, uh, into the intervention itself. Yeah, so, you know, that is how it looks like. So, but the thing is that, and then a theme by itself can take the whole health coaching call. It can be that we're talking about your daily steps. And steps is a behavioral, it's very strong, uh, if you will, measure, because you do steps to do things that you want to. Or at least you try to, kind of, we, we investigate that. What is it that you're doing with these 500 or 6,000 steps? I mean, so it's kind of, it's a, it's a cool conversation in itself. Then uh, we talk about you know how they rate their well-being. Tell me about that. So like, tell me about that day in which you said the well-being was excellent. Oh, my my kid came to home, or I did went to actually see my father in the hospice, or something like that. Then you start to identify things that provide meaning. We also try to kind of tease out the difference between meaning and happiness in the way that you know happiness has to do with actually will actually give you this sense of joy uh, now. Meaning is something long term that you actually do it. And many times when generosity kind of uh, put those two together, kind of I think it's the link of meaning and happiness going together. Uh, so generosity is big, kindness is big. So, uh, so, we, so, you know, you can, you know, it's usually a 20 minute call for 12 weeks. And uh, that's the intervention that we're testing that we're trying to now to roll out as an implementation uh, intervention. And uh, one of the things that stay in my mind like uh, the last few years is that who's going to pay for this? And, oh. the, and but, you know, but the thing is this, look at serendipity in life. Two years ago, Medicare came with remote patient monitoring codes. And then we end up having, uh, you know, we, those fit with our intervention. And we are kind of, we're rolling out something that actually will have, uh, you know, uh, it will be cost zero, probably will make some money, not a lot of money, but the, the return on investment decreasing with hospitalization and COPD improving quality of life, improving behavior. You have an implementation package in that. Right. right. I mean, so it's like, a, how do we put, I mean, we can put it in the field. That's his, And what did I do for that? I did nothing. That it was life that wanted to happen. So, the, you know, that uh, having that, uh, I think that having that great hope that what you're doing really will pay off. I mean, hope, I think, has everything to do with high performance. Yeah. And, uh, you, yeah. Know, uh, you know, you uh, know, because, as I said before, we can control the variables. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you you are at the Carecast, and we're talking to Roberto Benso from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, as you can uh, hear, is a passionate researcher in uh, helping patients with chronic conditions through mindfulness and implementing that in the course of clinical care and in patients' lives. Uh, Roberto, what what's your favorite collaboration? Um, well, the, the biggest collaboration I had in my life is my wife. Uh, so uh, I would be nothing without her, and uh, a, you know, a, I was kind of another very good student in medical school. You know, we we got married when we were, I was in medical school, so she made me finish, and uh, the, and she supported me in my career here when I was a non-speaking medical resident. Uh, 
uh, not speaking English, medical resident, kind of a very broken English. So, so I went through a lot. Uh, so I think that was my biggest, uh, most successful collaboration. It also uh, seems to seems to be seems to me that that was your first experience with major luck. <laughs> yes, serendipity is the most positive way you can think of. And uh, so, uh, but the, but I think that uh, you know um, uh, I I learned that uh, I learned that. Uh, I want to really pick uh, what is my inner circle. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that uh, I really believe in, uh, uh, in a, uh, you know, uh, in a culture based organization, in a relationship based organization. My lab is a relationship based lab. We care about each other. We, we you know, we really do hands down. And the other thing is that uh, is, that collaboration means that uh, people working with me will do things I don't know how to do and or I don't do it as well. And then, uh, so it's, uh, I think I really believe that, uh, you know, uh, that, that's why I'm kind of a collaboration. Yeah, I, I, but I, I want to make it to happen and uh, in the way that I really want to be on that relationship. and. Uh, uh, to, for, for me to for that to work, it need to be, be a relationship based organization. So, so your your program is based on on coaching. Um, have you had a collaboration with a uh, somebody who has made coaching phenomenal? Uh, well, yeah. Well, you know, uh, of I didn't invent invented that. I mean, over the years, I I, I work with tremendous people that uh, some of them taught me coaching and uh, they said, yeah, they, they, they told me, yeah, yeah we, maybe I mentioned coaching to you, uh, but it was already inside you. So I think that this is what actually great, uh, great collaborators are. It's like uh, they find something inside you that is worth cultivating and, uh, and then you grow out of that. And uh, yeah, so I, I did have, since I came to the Mayo Clinic, I work with tremendous people and uh, Mm -hmm. I would also I would say I would not I wouldn't be here if it were, were not for them you know because I I didn't know about coaching before coming to Mayo Clinic it's not that I knew it you know I got it before but, but, but most most listeners will hear about coaching and unless they're initiated into this kind of health coaching they will think oh you know oh like you mean like athletes right and um, so have you been uh, being coached by by someone in that circumstance okay thank you uh, uh, I was touched in my life to be trained by uh, uh, Michael Gorbet, and uh, which is the sports psychologist uh, of the Seattle Seahawks, and um, who worked with the Peter Seattle uh, uh, Seahawks are a football team, right? Yes. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a soccer guy, so I have no idea what you can. No, no, no. But it's, it's like uh, the thing is that they do have that culture. I mean, Pete Carroll, the head coach, and the, uh, uh, Michael Gorbet, kind of a kind of a crochet coin this idea of uh, kind of merging the you know uh, mindfulness and uh, a lot of other things like philosophy what's your philosophy in life what guides you vision where do you want to go i mean the, the they do uh, that with the football with the football players yes i mean and the, but the thing is that now is like if now it's infecting kind of a they, they did that work in boeing starbucks uh, you know uh, you know uh, microsoft uh, netflix i mean so it, it, it's um uh, so I, I learned that and, uh, you know, it's like uh, one of those things that you said, okay, you know, the thing that actually make you different after you learn those kind of things. So uh, I learned that high performance only happens in the present moment. That was profound to me because we were talking about our mindfulness and the present moment. They said very clear to me, high performance only happens now. So the thing is that is, uh, and also, I learned and I coined this idea that is, yeah, it's okay to win the Super Bowl. I think it's much stronger is to say in the last 15 years, we went to the playoff 15 times. So you are on that top level. You are on that, you know, it's like, a, you know, I will never get a, a Nobel Prize. I know that. But the issue is that I will try to kind of get my, my, my ideas to be funded and to be disseminated and to be implemented and help people. So trying to be on that, you know, that level of, if you will, uh, intensity and uh, uh, to be able to be at, at that sustained high performance. 
Hmm. You know, the, the people that are watching you are seeing something behind you, but the people that are listening to this may not. You have a sign in the back be, behind you that says enough is possible. What's that about? Oh, that's a, that's a work on uh, Peter Tenney. Peter Tenney uh, is, a, is, a, is an artist that uh, he used to be, um, a, a, you know, a broker in uh, Wall Street. And then at some point he decided to uh, kind of live that life of, uh, uh, you know, making money or thinking about money into disseminating his art and his, uh, and his philosophy of life. And he, um, he uh, kind of co-founded Wynwood, which is, a, is, a, is an uh, art uh, neighborhood in Miami. And, uh, and he got things like that. And, you know, and I comment so like, a, like a, you know, a, her, her, his work is like time is now. But enough is possible is, is, um, is very profound because it's, it's fostering the idea of enoughness. You know, it's like a, the, I mean, a, a, you know, stopping the idea that something is missing to the present moment. So, you know, yes, uh, but for that enough is possible, kind of to me, it's a practice because you only know the enoughness when you stop, when you actually have the helicopter view. Mm. And, uh, so it's like, uh, otherwise it's, uh, you know, I think that uh, um, the idea that happiness is now, so it's not, happiness is not coming when you, I do this and I do that, kind of, a, it's kind of, let's put the happiness before, uh, uh, and uh, before we, we before doing things, some many times the, the the paradigm is do this and then you will achieve it. I think that I think how about if we achieve it and see let's see what we do. And uh, so so is um, so enough if possible. I think is um, is recognizing that the, the you know the enoughness of life now. And uh, I think that again this guy kind of when, when I was walking this neighborhood in Wynwood in. In Miami, and I, I met I met his art. I became completely in love with this idea of delivering very short but profound uh, antibodies. And you know, I, I couldn't stop. Myself. I'm glad you were paying attention to it. <laughs> well, it's like I, you know, it's such a, you know those simple things that you know struck you. You kind of walk in the middle of it. So, so this this guy went from money to meaning, uh, which which I think takes me to ask you. So, what's the meaning of your work? What, what does it mean, what you do? Uh, uh, I think that we're, we're delivering, uh, we're trying to foster uh, people to discover meaningness and uh, meaning in life and enoughness and, uh, and in the context of that, uh, some happiness. And uh, I, mean, I think that that goes hand to hand with uh, all the outcomes that every Every institution is willing. Uh, hospitalizations, uh, ER visits, uh, days in the hospital. I, we just recently published that people that actually uh, that loneliness is, is I mean, independently associated with ER visits in patients with COPD. So what? So and the and the reason behind that is that when you are not lonely, you have uh, you when you have somebody to ask about, hey Victor, what can I do? I'm very short of breath. I didn't do it. So when you have nobody to actually ask anything in your life and you feel socially uh, distant, and uh, then you, the first thing you do is 911 and you end up in the ER when you, there's a problem. Mm. So, so I think that there are some factors that are very, that are the very core of your, uh, of your life that is uh, I feel kind of a very primitive stuff, like a feeling lonely or not. And so that has to do with ending up in the hospital or not. So not everything is... So going back to, to the COVID uh, analogy um, with breathlessness, um, uh, we are isolated, we are lonely, uh, we are separated from each other, um, we are feeling constrained, uh, perhaps even breathless. Um, and, and you're saying that um, through this process of mindfulness and coaching, you move people from panicking when the breathlessness rises to a certain level and then seeking medical care in the emergency room and so forth to a situation where they're able to recognize what's going on and manage it in a way that is, um, that is different, that, that doesn't, doesn't call for, for, for that kind of help. Um, uh, am I getting that right? Is that, is that sort of the, 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 the reframing that you do? 
how would that help us now? How would that help us now uh, in this in this time? How how does it help you? Do you you do you reframe? Do you do you um, do you find meaning in these times in ways that will make you don't let don't let don't let yourself panic and 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 go running for help? So I think I would try to create uh, conditions for people to express themselves, uh, particularly in situations like this in which we are, if you will. Uh, physically isolated. So I think that the, the, there's a lot of engagement between the, the coaches and the patients. And uh, so, and there's a lot that we will we learn from just listening to our own words. So it's like, a, it's like when you go to and get a, you know, some psychotherapy and then many times if they just listen to you and then you actually kind of uh, listen to what you're saying, which is your own self. And then you make decisions out of that. We try to kind of uh, create a, a, you know, uh, coaching by itself is a clinical decision support tool. So the thing is that mm. it's like a, allows people to make good decisions. I mean, and to, uh, to at least to weigh those decisions with that person that they trust so much, which is the coach. Uh, so, uh, and then we try to be very focused. It's not, it's not chatty chatty. I mean, the, the, the essence is to engage people, make sure that you are there with him, with them, and they know that, and then uh, to focus on something to evoke what is important for them in that, in that, uh, in those things that they want to talk about, and then make a plan. So, it's, uh, so I, I like to invite the attendees to begin to use the Q and A box to uh, ask some questions of Roberto as we uh, as we uh, go into this uh, next uh, section here. Uh, so I, I'll be uh, paying attention to those questions and and try to ask them uh, as well. Um, uh, so we've we've. Um, We've, we've learned uh, so far that you've gotten to be who you are through uh, paying attention, responding, um, uh, letting serendipity guide you, um, being authentic, uh, built on strong collaborations, um, and uh, bring a spirit of support, connection, humanity, uh, to the work that you do, to the intervention design, to the implementation process that you followed, and that you do it in the collaboration of, of people in your lab. And you said that you care deeply for each other. Um, our, our unit is interested in this notion of care. Um, what, what does care mean to you? And, and how do you think we do, um, we do better when we make care fit in the lives of the patients that we care for? So uh, we, uh, we usually say um, in the lab that uh, we, we want to make sure that what we're doing matters to each one of us that is, uh, is, is beyond work. We all grind with work every day with things that we don't like. But the thing is that most of the time, the overarching idea is that we're doing something that is making a difference. And then uh, Kind of every every one of us is try is kind of a uh, convinced that we are a critical piece of that machine, and uh, so is um, you know that's why we we coined the idea that team the word team doesn't have an I in it. There's no I in team, so there's there's no letter I. It's pretty much about the, the group, and uh, so the. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, we, there's a great deal of sincerity that need to happen. And uh, so you need to go, yeah, we are a team as soon as you do your work. Uh, so it's like, a, you know, it's, so, uh, and the other thing is that I, things are done uh, many times in other ways that I would do it. And that took me a while to actually understand that. But the thing is that, and they're done, probably better. No, 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 no. Uh, forget probably, kind of off the record probably. The pro things are done better because I don't have my hands into it. So the thing is that this level of, if you will, hand, trust that people are putting their best to do things mm -hmm. is, a, is a very, very, very important part of that. Be you know, it's like, a, yeah, say, do it, but show it to me before. So it's like, a, so it's, um, I think that trust is one of the things that also is an, is a, one of the uh, issues, one of the key factors in high performance and in, and in a relationship-based organization. It, it, creates, it creates conditions for flourishing. Absolutely. 
And, and the other thing is that if I, uh, so I, I want to coin a comment of uh, uh, Steve Jobs again. Steve Jobs said, if you ask yourself five days in a row, why you're doing what you're doing, you probably could be thinking about doing something else. So the thing is that, so the, the issue is that everybody there is kind of a, I mean, I asked them to do that question. And, uh, and uh, so to make sure that we are, we are kind of a pushing along like a kind of a, 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 as, a you know, as, 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 as together, you know, it's, um, it, and it, it's something that you, you build. And, you know, I, as I mentioned before to you, Victor, it's not that I got it, I'm trying. So I think that, you know, I, I see myself, I mean. Uh, yeah, yeah, but you're trying, but you're, you're already at a very high level. And so, so um, one of the questions that we've received is, you know, how, wh what advice do you give people, people who are still looking to find the sense of meaning in their work? Uh, well, the thing is, uh, so ask that question. So it's, uh, so they can put your phone away. Uh, I mean, uh, to stop the TV, sit down and start asking that question while you're walking now in the, in the middle of the, of the fall. And then, so what is it? I mean, and, uh, I mean it's kind of a, it's a self-discovery. So uh, the, the, it's, uh, it's about what is meaningful for me or not. I mean, and the thing is that, let me just say this, it's not that tomorrow you actually can change everything because we, have, we also need to pay the, you know, need to pay the rent and we need to have the food in the, in, the, in the place of our kids. But the thing is that life is fair and it will bring you to a, to a decision tree and of actually changing. If you, but to, in order to change, you need to get there with that sense, yeah, I gotta go, I gotta, I gotta get out of here. Like mm. that. And uh, so I think that, uh, you know, ask yourself many times, what is the, the good and the, and the not so good of what you're doing? And uh, uh, pay, pay a lot of attention to opportunities in front well, of you. Some of us are afraid to ask that question. And I think yeah. fear is an important, uh, a barrier or motivator, right? Yep. Uh, uh, so I actually have a question that is coming and they're asking you, what is a challenge that you had to overcome and how has overcoming that challenge impacting your work, impacted your work? Um, yeah. Um, so the, uh, I think that one of the challenges that I, I need to face is that that in, at some point, I, I thought, I think everything kind of depending on my decision or everything kind of depending on me or what I actually say uh, is, um, I think that trusting more was a very important part of me moving forward. Uh, mm. Trusting more people around me that they, uh, so it's, um, that's why collaboration is important, but also picking who you're working with. Uh, and I make that decision. And that, uh, so yes, I think that one, that was one. So kind of a stop thinking about it, you can control, I mean, and think that uh, everything. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, because in the context of passion, oh yeah, we want to do this. And I want to do it in that way. Then, oh, no, wait a minute, you know, you know, this is the direction, but may not be the, the right way. So, and then uh, stop and listen. And uh, because people around you may be able to have a, the, the answer or try other things. Uh, so that kind of a, uh, that was something that was a, a challenge for me. Uh, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I, I grew up with my dad telling me that my approach to feel, to deal with challenges, if, if you imagine a challenge like a wall was to just run really quickly against the wall and just, you know, try to crush through it. And, and he always encouraged me to find ways around it or over and not that I don't have to go head first into the wall. And in fact, one of the questions uh, that we've received uh, is, you know, how do you encounter adversity? Do you feel it as a barrier to work around, as a challenge to face and overcome, or as a block to navigate around to avoid clearly the the person asking the question doesn't use my approach to just going, trying to go through it. Um, so so we, we, how do you take, how do you take those uh, parent barriers? Uh, how, how do you handle them? There is a Zen saying, the obstacle is the path. Mm. The obstacle is the path. I think that the obstacle is what actually will pay kind of a higher attention. I mean, I mean, how I, we actually will move. Think about the water when it comes from the, the top of the mountain and encounter a rock. It does just go on the side. It doesn't really try to push the rock to actually go through. It just go on the side. So we just need to be like water. 
kind of a, kind of try to find out a way around that situation. So I think that is is difficult, but it's meaningful. So it's it's important. It's it's, it's about seeing those problems and as an opportunity of higher awareness. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that, you need to stop on a daily basis because problems kind of pop up like a you know permanently. And uh, uh, knowing yourself uh, that you need help. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, try to get your, your circle to help you. But the point is, I'm going back to the point, uh, I think it's a, it's a cliche, but I really think it is right. Problems, uh, challenges uh, are opportunities. And, uh, and I, I, I became to love challenge. And I think that is, when you go into the high performance field, I mean, I, when I learned from the Seattle Seahawks and their organization is that people that are Olympians, people that are at that level, love challenge. They just love it, kind of bring it on. So the thing is that, you know, it's like, a, so the thing is that, you know, uh, so, and you have to be also, uh, I, I like to quote um, the people from the, persuasion lab in Stanford that they are working on uh, on the um, you know on how attention is being paid because attention is one of the biggest commodity in our in a lifetime uh, so uh, the thing is that they work on tiny habits mm. uh, they work on tiny things like floss one tooth like I, what I'm trying to say with that is that when you're trying to kind of change your path, your path in front of you, start very small because, but that will like, create a condition to go to the next level. So it will be two, two tooth and then, then your whole, your whole teeth. And that, 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 so it's, uh, it's really a process uh, and uh, identifying the problem, finding a tiny, a tiny change, prove it, go back. For that, you need to kind of sit down. Yeah. And and it's, uh, for many of our listeners who are involved in improvement, this is uh, part of their the mantra. One of the questions that uh, that we get is um, that there is um, uh, a this challenge uh, of generosity when it comes to uh, clinical care, and and the person asking the question is quite concerned that some people, perhaps even people with your passion and your commitment, uh, might come to care with a lot of generosity and a lot to give. And that could have, uh, and the question asker has, uh, points to two potential problems. One is that over eagerness to help uh, might be misguided and might do more harm than good. And the other one is that it might uh, end up um, extinguishing whatever energy that you have that brought you in in the first place. Uh, you're a passionate guy. You're coming in all in. Uh, how do you how do you manage that? How how do you how what are the boundaries of that generosity that you bring to your work? So uh, we need to make a good distinction between cheerleading people uh, with uh, true uh, with um, you know the sense of uh, generosity of your attention. So I actually I'm actually pretty serious, and uh, when I but I sit with a patient and uh, and I, I listen, I try, I try to listen very deeply, trying to find out what actually, what is needed, what is possible. The other thing I do is I want to make sure that when I get there, I am balanced myself. Uh, so it's like a, when you, you want to make sure that you are in a good position to give. Uh, some days you and me and everybody in the world have situations and then some days you're not at a beat or so the thing is that this a lot as I said before the biggest patient you want to change is the one you see in the mirror so you start by actually trying to make sure that you're generous with yourself you're attentive to a condition today if you have a problem with your wife today or your kid or your bank account or I mean you probably will not be the same thing as other days so the thing is that so uh, we, we are careful. And the other thing is that when I sit with a patient, I need to pay attention to what I need to pay attention. So of course, it's not that I'm gonna be talking about mindfulness and the, you know, the, the obstacle is the path. I just need to make sure that the lung function is fine. The x-rays is perfect. And so the thing is that we, we, we put together the whole thing and that is what actually we need to try to get. Health comes from the world whole. 
I mean, that, that means that health is about being in balance with everything that is going on. So the thing is that but we need to, we as providers, we try to put that together. So, so we, I mean, cheerleading doesn't help anybody. Of course, we can pitch phone for until you, but yeah. It's about the, the issue is that this cheerleading is not coaching. So, 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 so just, just to be clear, when you talk about generosity, what do you mean by generosity? It's, it's giving myself completely to the present moment with the patient. Giving uh, yourself completely to the present moment with the patient. So in that, in, we're talking about the medical act, right? So yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, let, let's think, I mean, but the same happened with your kid, the same happened with your wife, the same happened with your friend, the same happened when you actually, uh, when you're riding a, a bike, just ride, okay? Don't, don't do anything, just ride, or just swim, or just run, or just jump. It's that wholeheartedness that you actually- oh, but, but multitasking is, is lovely, isn't it? Well, it's, I think it's applicable. I think that the beauty of this, Victor, is that it's applicable to every walk of life. Mm. Um, so the thing is that, so the, you know, sometimes, of course, and you make mistakes, sometimes you go too much and to be too, too cheerful with the patient and he or, does, or she doesn't like it. Or, but the, the point is that, are you paying attention to this? To, to yeah. actually need to be a pay, pay attention in the moment. So, it's, uh, so they're coming to the Mayo Clinic because they want to do what, they're, what to do with their lungs. So let's, let's start being very clear. So, uh, what, what, so yeah. competence and compassion, not just, uh, not just uh, one or the other. I think it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, 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 the actual alchemy is to actually put it together and then kind of, uh, so, and, mm. uh, and getting something better. Like uh, it's, uh, so more... talking about that, um, uh, if you were to think about um, uh, some, so it, for someone who's paying attention uh, to what's going on and trying to serve the serendipity, have you gotten to a point where you wish you had done something differently? Uh, I ask very careful to myself if I, if there will be any benefit of that kind of a, a kind of questioning. So yes, but you know, so to make sure that you're not always kind of a reflecting on, oh, I should have done this, I should have, because the, now the present moment is full of those kind of frustrations, okay? Mm. But, but so the, but the point, yes, I mean, you, you look carefully at, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the essence of, uh, you know, examining life in the present moment. So the thing is that you, it's not a kind of a cognitive thing. You just sit down with what is happening. If you actually feel that you did something that it should be done different, you just do it. Or, or you just do it. You, you put the conditions for that to happen different in the next time. Uh, so, so yeah. So you, you you've hinted at, at a notion of self care, right? That there is there is a notion that when you when you show up and, and so forth, and you want to be in the moment, there's a there's a there seems to be a discipline behind this. And then not not just mentally to be present, but puts your puts you in a in a good place. How do you how do you do, do you separate your life from your work? Is it a big you know soup or do you have boundary? How, how do you handle that? That's the, the, the famous balance of work and life. Uh, I think that, um, or is it a, that's an artificial construct that you don't pay attention? Well, you know, I, I, I really don't. I think that, uh, you know, I think that, um, and so I think that I, I'm not sure if it's work life balance. I think there is life and we're trying to balance and we try to be balanced with that. So, uh, I think that, uh, I like so much what I do that I, you know, I can yeah, You I, seem to have integrated your work into your life and your life approach to your work approach in a way that it seems seamless at the moment. Well, the thing is that, but let, let me, many times I think about a, a, a mechanic or I think about a janitor with, with I mean, in which all those uh, very, those uh, professions are novel by themselves, but, you know, probably, you know, you probably don't choose uh, sometimes people, you are forced to do things that you don't like. I mean, I'm coming from a country in which a lot of people are workers and they are poor. And so the thing is that, so uh, those people, uh, you know, sometimes they cannot really find the same degree of enjoyment that I have in my own work, but they are looking, they're, have, they're trying to survive with that. And then, you know, the try balance comes from other things like, uh, you know, having, uh, you know, have, having the, the great degree of community that happens in the, 
in the Latin countries and also, the, you know, what they do, I mean, look, watching soccer and getting together. So other things that are compensating that other thing that we need to grind for, for a higher meaning, because you have to pay the rent, you have to kind of give, bring food to your kids. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not easy. So you're in an academic medical center. How do you balance all these, you know, being mindful and generous with the people you work with, with your patients, with your colleagues, with this notion that you have to be strategic politically, if even in the way you handle yourself uh, in an academic medical center that is, that is often set up to be very hierarchical and results focused? How, how, do, you, how do you handle that bit? Or is that one of those things that you also don't care about? <laughs> yeah, well, um, I, um, my politics is no politics. <laughs> uh, so, uh, um, I, I try to be sincere, really. And, uh, you know, well, I think, some of us, when we get, when we are, when we are trying to be sincere, we get into a lot of trouble. Yeah. Well, the thing is that sometimes is the way we are sincere. And, uh, but, but I think that, uh, I, I, I try to float with the system and if I can do something to improve it, I will do it. I, but it's a, I, I like the idea of like a cork that floats in the water. I try to flow with the system, understand it, and then making sure that I, I have an opportunity to, uh, to actually say something or change something. I think that in my experience, opportunities came to me in which they asked me for stuff. I don't try to go change anything, especially in coaching. I don't want to change anybody anything because we don't change people by telling how to do it or what to do. We don't change that. Behavior change doesn't happen that way. It happens when you create conditions for change. It, it, it's a magical thing when, when I listen to you, Roberto, because you get the sense of someone with a very clear direction or directionality, I guess might be the term, in your life. And yet your metaphor is a cork on the water. No, no, no uh, sail to catch the wind. No, no rudder to the uh, serendipity as 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 an explanation for your success. It, it, it's it's hard to maintain to, to to but you do it right. But it's hard to keep those two ideas in balance. A, a clear way of looking at the world and how you're going to be in it, and at the same time being completely open to what the the present uh, brings. I, let me just say this, Victor. I, 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 trust, uh, I trust life. I really do. And uh, uh, I really do. I really do. I really trust that we, uh, life evolves in, in, the, in the right way. Uh, and then uh, if we we'll pay attention, we will actually we'll fulfill for what we are here for. And, and this is an evolving concept. And uh, so it's, but it's very beautiful to feel like that you're trying to do something that you know, it's who you are. And uh, even, if, even if you are in the intent, and I'm gonna, so it's not about getting to the summit, it's about climbing. It's about keep climbing, keep going. And, uh, you know, so that's why, I mean, but, but I, you know, I don't know. I think that there, there's, there's someone here that's interested in, in building a team and they're saying, well, if you were to start to build your, your lab from scratch, um, how do you go about doing that? I, to, to get to to get to the point where you're talking about we all care about each other and so forth. Well, you need to have this sense of a connection with the first person, and it doesn't need to be the the smart test or the a sense of connection and you that in the in the in the in the in your inner heart saying I can work with this person, I feel like I can work with this person. So it's a uh, so it's the, um, so we need to be very careful about our connection, collaboration, and the, because everything is about the team. And the, so the thing is, so my recommendation is very deep, you know, as much as you can, knowledge of that, uh, you know, uh, person that you bring in. Uh, make sure that you express yourself about what you want to do, and uh, that, that there's communion into that. I think everything started there. I think uh, that's what. Yeah, you know. it's, in, it's incredibly hard. I mean, just during our conversation, I had in my own computer multiple alarms alerting me of different things that are coming up. And there's a lot of 
a lot of things competing for our attention, a lot of things trying to take us away from the present. And, um, uh, and it's, it's incredibly challenged. Um, we have two more questions, um, uh, Roberto. One, um, with all that openness uh, to the present moment and the generosity, um, for, for you, you take care of patients directly. You might have found yourself in a situation where in taking care of a patient, with you completely open, um, this was a, 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 you know, a hard, difficult, emotionally challenging experience. How, how, do, you, how do you handle that? Um, uh, is, there, is, there an, is there something that comes to mind in relation to, to that particular situation? Uh, thank you for the question. I think it's very appropriate because the thing is that we handle the patient as a team. I cannot really say how many times my, my, my assistant helped me a lot in the care of my patient, in the nitty gritty of things. I mean, uh, you know, uh, of, I mean, yeah, of course, I, do, I wouldn't be willing to actually do 20 phone calls to the pharmacy, to the insurance. And to, so we need to make sure we have an, a proper network. So the, the physician assistant that work with us, the, the, uh, the nurse that work with us, the, uh, the, our, our secretaries and, and us. So we are all in that sharing of that sometimes burden because we're talking about, yes, kind of uh, identify things of breathlessness and the, so I'm talking about all this behavior change, but you know, there's, there is life too. Life, the life that you're talking about is that, oh, 20 phone calls that need to be answered. And, so we need to have a way to share that. And, uh, so, and, the, and the burden need to be light, not overwhelming, because when the burden is overwhelming, people get burned out. Hmm. That's, that's the essence of our minimally disruptive medicine approach and of this series, of this care cast focus on care that fits. We've been talking to Roberto Benso and we've learned uh, quite a bit, Roberto, about you about what animates you, about what animates your work, uh, about the challenge, how central to your work is authenticity, how central to your work is generosity. Um, it's, it's been an absolute delight uh, to chat with you. I, I have one last question to, to close uh, this, uh, this care cast uh, with you, Roberto, and, and to thank you for it. Um, what's next for Roberto Benzo? Uh, okay, here it is is for what now for Roberto Benzo. So whatever is going on now is the foundation of my future. I really, uh, be, you know, it's like, a, it's bringing me to the what now, what now, what actually entertain me? So what, how different is my grief right now? Uh, how different is my passion right now? Where's, uh, that take me, it's like the stream, you know, it's the, you know, I don't, I don't push the river. I let the river just go into its own course. So the thing is that, yeah, so if I actually pay attention to it, I mean, I think that it will take me to the next step uh, pleasantly, you know, pleasantly. And uh, so, uh, you know, I don't think too much on 2030. I think about 2020. And I, I really want to kind of get with everything, every, every cell of my body, how much are we changing our life, everybody, because of something that we never thought possible, COVID. So the thing is that this should be a wake up call that, Kind of, we just need to be attentive because we probably need very quick changes. And the last thing I want to say, uh, Victor, is this. We need research that is done quickly and, uh, and it will be done uh, so we can actually provide uh, answers quickly to respond to the needs now. So that's why I think NIH is changing to that kind of shorter, shorter hours kind of to be able to actually respond quickly to the needs of the now. So what now is the thing? No, what now? So what's next for Roberto Benso? is what is now. Yeah. Roberto, what a wonderful, wonderful conversation. It's been absolutely lovely. I've enjoyed myself tremendously. Uh, your presence through it and your generosity in answering the questions of, of those who uh, join us today has been a demonstration of the words that uh, you shared with us today. Thank you again uh, for coming. Thanks everyone who joined us live. Uh, and if you're listening uh, or watching this afterwards, uh, thank you for your attention. Don't miss uh, the next uh, CareCast uh, produced by the Knowledge and Evaluation Research Unit at Mayo Clinic. And please take care. Thank you so much.